Today, we are honored to have Fabrice Grinda, founding partner at FJ Labs, joining us. Fabrice, uh, welcome. Thank you for having me. All right. So sit back for a second. I'm going to give a little bit of a background on you, and um, and then we'll jump right into a number of the questions. So Fabrice is a prominent internet entrepreneur and investor with a notable track record of 300 exits and 1,100 angel investments via his role as founding partner at FJ Labs, a venture capital firm. Before becoming an investor, Fabrice launched a number of successful companies, such as OLX, the largest classified site in India, Brazil, Pakistan, Poland, Ukraine, Russia, Portugal, and many other emerging markets, operating in 50 countries and has over 3,000 employees. Before OLX, Fabrice founded and led Zingy, one of the largest wireless media companies in the Americas. Fabrice initiated his entrepreneurial journey in 1998 with the creation of Auckland, which evolved into one of Europe's largest auction sites. Beyond his ventures, Fabrice worked as a management consultant for McKinsey & Company, holding a BA in economics from Princeton University. He engages in global travel, kite surfing, which uh, looks intense, at tennis, and shares insights on his personal and professional life through blogging at Fabrice Grinda, that's G-R-I-N-D-A dot com. So, Thank you. Welcome. I, I've, I've heard a number of tales from your journeys, and I can't wait to jump into a number of them here. So you began uh, your entrepreneurial journey in 1998, and uh, having co-founded and you're a CEO in a number of successful ventures, like I mentioned, in Auckland and Zingy and OLX. I'm going to cover a few anecdotes I heard from uh, building each company and ask you for a lesson or lessons learned from each respective company. So uh, so let, let's jump into this. You left McKinsey to start Auckland. Um, so after college, you went McKinsey, worked there, and then you left McKinsey, start Auckland, uh, the eBay uh, for France in, in your early 20s. Uh, a couple years or so into building Auckland, you could have sold it to eBay for... I believe the offer is 20 million, but you wanted to continue growing it. You were able to eventually raise 50, 60 plus million. At the end, you sold your stake to a private investor. What were some lessons learned from your experience? Because that is that's fascinating. Creating a company at a very at fairly quickly, already having a certain type of offer and declining it and then growing it. So I'm sure there's a million things that you learned, but what are some that come to mind? Yeah. So um, I knew I wanted to be a tech founder, by the way, before I even went to college or McKinsey. McKinsey was like, business school, except they pay you. And when I created my company, you know, I, I actually like creating something out of nothing. I wanted to be a founder and it, it felt and I guess when you're 23, I was 23 at the time, I didn't realize how much money like $20 million was. Uh, and <laughs> when you have, you know, it, 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 I had nothing, <laughs> but somehow it didn't feel meaningful in any way, shape or form. I'm like, nah, I want to build something massive. I'm going to change the world. Uh, and 20 million is nothing, you know, there'll be opportunity to make it in the future. I'll build something much bigger. And even if it fails, whatever. And I didn't realize how, life-changing and meaningful that amount of money was and so <laughs> i i dismissed it without even considering it honestly i was like meh nah um and in a way it was the correct choice um because like maybe i raised the capital we grew dramatically and then later got a 300 million dollar buyout offer from ebay um mm. so yes we had taken the dilution so instead of owning 75 percent of the company i now own 40 percent of the company but 40% of 300 million is 120 million. It's still worth a lot more than the 75 of 20. The problem, mm. uh, um, that said, in hindsight, knowing how hard it is to make money and how life changing it is, and the fact that it can, uh, that that it, it it can it can make it easier for you to fund your next startups, et cetera, probably should have taken the 20 to begin with. Uh, number two, that said, once the 300 came came, I could not convince my VCs to take the offer. Um, and, and so that was a, another big lesson there in the sense that I had not really spent any, I did I never raised money before. So I didn't, I'd never negotiated a stock purchase agreement before I didn't have a drag along, so I could not force a sale. Uh, I, I didn't have all the core rights that I would have been expected to. Now, of course, this is in a time period where these rights, you know, safe notes didn't exist. 
uh, mm. standard set of docs didn't exist. And also, I'd, I'd never done these things before. So I didn't know. I, I relied on my lawyer, who's supposed to have known better, and didn't negotiate the right rights. So couldn't force a sale. Uh, ultimately, we merged with a publicly traded company, uh, notionally, for a lot more. But that stock promptly fell 99.98%. And I was telling the VC, oh. these are not a good, this is not a good company. The eBay offers way better, but uh, I can convince them. And many lessons learned. So A, $20 million is a lot of money. <laughs> B, um, make sure you have like standard set of rights, like, you know, drag, drag rights, uh, or at least and piggyback um, and preemptive rights. And three, um, Pick a VC who's aligned with you, right? Like I raised money at the highest valuation uh, from the person who invested the most. And, but ultimately it was not a normal VC. It was a very rich French person who uh, wanted to show the world that they understood the internet, but they weren't in it. They weren't in it to build successful companies. They weren't in it to like appear in the press to be strategic. And so when the time came to exit, they didn't care about exit. I mean, the problem with, someone who's worth 100 billion, I mean, at that time, I think it was only 20 billion, is yeah. making a couple hundred million more makes no difference to them. And so when the, even though it was my recommendation that we should exit, they were like, no, nah, I'm not exiting. And I couldn't change that. Uh, and they were in control, even though it was my company. And so uh, a number of mistakes in terms of, uh, yeah, raising money from the wrong VC to negotiating the wrong rights to not realizing how much money uh, $20 million was at the beginning. So yeah, a lot of interesting life lessons. Then again, if I'd made $120 million at like 25, so this was like two years later, when when the eBay offer came, I probably would have been an arrogant, insufferable asshole. And so, you know, <laughs> uh, it, 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 the <laughs> eating a piece of humble pie, going from zero to hero, you know, and cover every magazine, et cetera, back to zero again, uh, was probably a very valuable life lesson that I needed to learn, you know? I love that. That's very reflective. I, uh, that's, uh, and, and, uh, and and life changing so that's that's incredible yeah. uh let's move on to the next venture so zingy uh for this second venture i heard you originally were thinking of an idea that you could bootstrap uh instead of finding venture capital for it what made you think this way and i know that eventually you also had to fundraise but it was a very hard journey uh much harder than your first experience can you cover some of that well, when you're raising money in the bubbles, right, like in the 1998, uh, with the pedigree, I could say, oh, top my class at Princeton, McKinsey, refer, one of the first to ever be promoted directly to associate, whatever, like people were throwing money at me. Uh, in 2001, I knew the world had changed. And it was obvious that capital was going to be either impossible to raise or extraordinarily difficult. And therefore... And but and, and and by the way, I thought the internet was not going to be this big thing. I'm like, you know what? It's not going to be a a, a a a the revolution I expected it to be. It's not going to be big. It's not going to be a big way to make money. But I like. <laughs> I'm not doing this because I want to make money. I'm doing this because I like the zero to one. I'd like to be a tech founder. Um, I would like to be mission driven, but because my core mission right now is to be a founder, I'm willing to sacrifice the idea to just do something that I think I can build profitably with very limited capital. And so it was more a reflection of the macro circumstances in which we found ourselves, which is like the the, the winter of, of, of tech, basically. It was like, mm. uh, uh, even though it was not a global recession, it was a tech recession. It was very, very deep. And, and so even I picked an when, idea. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Go on, go on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. So 2001, I'm like, okay, I'm going to do ringtones, not because I liked ringtones. I thought it was silly, uh, but I thought I could build it pretty cost effectively in the US uh, because it had been successful in Europe and in Asia. Mm. And did you, so focusing on ringtones because you're you're thinking about how quickly in terms of go to market you can you can you can sell this uh, and and already start generating revenue or profit. But even before, even when you pick that idea, did you try to fundraise or it, it you did and it was because it was such a gloomy market that it just didn't work out or what what was the case oh no i i actually tried to fundraise uh in fact the first two years were painful i invested every last penny i had i borrowed a hundred thousand of my credit card i slept on the couch at the office i lived in new york essentially two dollars a day i mean i couldn't even afford coffee i could only eat ramen noodles uh missed payroll 27 times i talked to every vc but i think by the time <laughs> 
I think my first sentence that happened when I'm telling them I'm doing BDC telecom, when every BDC company in the world from Webvan to Pets.com, I'd gone under, every telco company like MCI WorldCom had gone under, I don't think I'd finished the sentence they'd hung up, right? Like there was no <laughs> traction. I, I never even got a meeting to to raise capital. So, you know, I try to raise capital. It would have like saved uh, a lot of hair loss. Uh, <laughs> and... and but it was impossible. And, and, and here's the irony is once we became profitable, because so this company was built the old fashioned way on profits. You know, we went from a million revenues in 02 to five in 03 to 15 04 to 205. But like we became Jesus. profitable. Hold on. Yeah. So a million, when did you get a million? In, in how in long? Revenues in 2002. And when, 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 the, when did you, uh, found, how long had the company been operating? For, for... Uh, I created the company July 2, 2001, and we launched a couple months after that, basically. So wow. we did okay. million revenues so, first I year. Mean, a, mi yeah. a million in, 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 in a year, in 12, 12 months of, uh, or a bit less, that's that's still fairly impressive. It and was even okay. When it, yeah, it was so money. Even with that now. million, you're trying to fundraise, and and no one would pick up the phone. Wow. No VCs. I know I raised I raised 1.4 million, but I raised 1.4 million in in 5 to 10k increments. Any person I would meet, I would like, "Ah, oh, this amazing startup, please invest." And I did raise 1.4 million, but literally in in 10 in the biggest check I was getting was like 10k. And at some point I ran out of friends and family that I could beg and grovel for money, <laughs> uh, which is why I ended up missing payroll so many times. Uh, and of course, every time we tell the employees, I don't understand what we're wrong. The banks didn't purchase the wire product, the, the, the payroll <laughs> properly this month. Of course, I didn't have any money. <laughs> so that's why it wasn't processed. That's but weird. then I would then find some guy to give me 5K, to... oh, make my... payroll. <laughs> oh my God, that is wild. I love that. I love hearing that journey. There, uh, so many of us founders have... Uh, have gone through that or are going through that. So this yeah. is this is really helpful to be able to hear that. Um, you're by, by saying- the, way, the most meaningful day of my entrepreneurial journey to date is August 15, 2003, the day we became cash flow positive. Not EBITDA positive, cash flow positive. We, we were EBITDA positive for three, four months already because then we were masters of our own destiny. We knew we were not gonna mm -hmm. die. And I was able to pay back uh, my 100,000 credit card debt and all the things I haven't paid and the back payroll, et cetera. Um, that was the most, to date, that, the most So that was three years, life. three three years into it? Something like that? Yeah, two, two years, years and into two it? months. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. Even more than you mentioned in the fourth year, you're already generating 200 million. Um, yeah. You you ended up, well, so I always love asking this question to every one of our special uh, unicorn founders in, in, in this show. Do you remember what your first sale, to whom it was, and how did you get it going? How did you sign that first customer? I know with Zingy, it, this, you were selling to, to enterprise. Eventually. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to sell the enterprise. I wanted to run the the mobile content platforms for the operators. But in 2001 in the US, it was the dark ages. There was no there was no text messaging. You could not text message within an operator, let alone cross operator. Mm. They didn't think they needed this content, even though it was huge in Europe and Asia. And I was not. They were not picking up my phone calls either. So I launched direct to consumer, just as a proof of concept. I even I had to hack my way into the the delivery networks and gateways at like AT and T and Singular, et cetera, to be able to deliver. They didn't. I didn't have a contract with them. I just like found a way to deliver through their <laughs> gateways that were open. Uh, I, I, I started selling. Yeah, charging via credit card, like the and I had the consumer have to pick their network and and and. And, and phone, it was like the most archaic way of delivering. And, and that's why I didn't really scale the, at the beginning. But the point was showing up at all the conferences, being a CTIA, uh, proving my staying power. And I kept knocking the door of the carriers. Eventually, MSN at that time was like desperate for, for, for revenue. So I essentially bribed them. I gave them like, I don't know. 100K or 50K to become their official partner, which led a press release, which lent us to some credibility, even though it didn't really lead to any revenues. Then randomly, uh, at that time, Motorola was running the Nextel, uh, the Nextel content portal. They reached out randomly and they said, hey, we saw you have a deal at Microsoft. Um, do you want to 
discuss doing something with us. So we started running it for them. And then Nextel reached out to me and said, hey, well, you know, this is working pretty well. Can we do it directly? And then the first real contract that went live was Sprint. But I'd been knocking the doors for two years and a half. And it's just little by little, be, through staying power and presence is showing we're not this uh, flash in the pan startup, got the contract. When Sprint did it, everyone else wanted to do it. So then it became, uh, you know, they're all lemmings. So once Sprint had done it, it was mm. successful. We got a call from everyone from AT&T to Singular to Verizon. to, And then we went from like dying for revenues to being overworked, especially with no money, to, re to build connectivity and partnerships with all these people. And also they sent me like three, you know, these are ginormous companies. They sent me like 300 page RFPs. I filled in the RFPs myself. I just promised to do everything. I just said, yeah, we'll do everything. Once we had signed the contract, I obviously didn't deliver an a 20th of what I'd, uh, I'd promised, but it didn't matter. <laughs> That's why they were pregnant and they didn't have a choice. So I focused on the core. I'm like, you know what? I promised all these other things, but you know, let's do this to get going and then we'll work on the rest later. And, and, and they worked. kept and then, with it and they were like, and they sure. kept with it. It's too late. We were, we were coding and they, and we were live and it worked extraordinarily well. Did, um, when you were going directly to the consumer, even though it wasn't scalable, um, how, how long were you, what was the time period? And then what led you to what type of numbers or what type of um, key indicators were you looking at that allowed you to say, you know what, like we, we really are up to something. I know this, like, we got to keep, keep knocking on these doors. We got to keep doing this. Like what, what, what was the shining light for you there? It was not our numbers. Our numbers were de minimis and irrelevant. It was the fact that in Japan, this was a multi-billion dollar category and profitable. In Korea, it was a multi-billion dollar category and profitable. In Europe, there were multiple players that were like doing hundreds of millions of sales and profitable. And so if you know, humans globally are very similar. If something works somewhere, mm. it's going to work somewhere else because at the at our core, we want to communicate. We want to socialize. We, we want to have a sense of purpose. We want to be entertained. Ideas that be, and if something works somewhere, it's going to work elsewhere. Now it's going to be, you need to adapt that it. it's not a carbon copy, but fundamentally the ideas are pretty similar. And that's, it works so well in the rest of the world. I'm like, it's going to work in the US. It's just a question of time. And I need to be there when, when the market opens up with the, all the building blocks in place. Now, if it had taken two more years, I probably would have been dead. So fortunately it happened, uh, before I ran out of like complete steam and cash, et cetera. Uh, and yeah. As, as you were signing up these uh, enterprises, so Sprint and all the other enterprises that came along, uh, for in terms of team and talent, was there a moment where you said, uh, we need to bring some individuals with enterprise level experience when it came to, you know, for sales? So you already had that. No. And, you know, who, I, I I'm curious just, to know. I was like, a who, sales guy. Uh, I couldn't afford salespeople anyway. Uh, and in fact, the main issue is we want, at some point I stopped being able to, pay. after I signed the Sprint deal and we signed everyone else, I didn't right. have any cash until Sprint paid us. So we signed Sprint April, we went live April 1, 2003, but they paid quarterly plus 45. The check arrived August 15, 2003. But once they went live, everyone else wanted to sign, but I didn't pay my, my staff from uh, April 1 to August 15. So we went from 27 people to seven because, you know, when you stop paying people, they stop showing up for work for some reason. I, don't get that. Uh, and so all of a sudden, we were massively overworked with everyone wanting to sign us. Uh, and we had, we had no more staff. So I, I had to start coding again. Uh, I, was a, I was project manager slash front end developer slash head of sales slash you name it. Customer uh, success. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Fortunately, we still had the core, the CTO and the core back office team that could help with uh, the integrations. But uh, yeah, we went live and finally we were profitable and then we scaled. And I sold the company a year later uh, for 80 million in cash. So this time for cash, not equity. And um, and I sold over half of it. But that was not the most meaningful day in my life because at that point we were on a rocket ship. We went, you know, as, we, as I said, we did 5 million revenue, 50, 200. We're hiring people right and left. We're growing like crazy. I was so busy. My my reward to myself for selling the company was like I I think I bought an Xbox, a TV, and a tennis racket, and I'm like you know I, I still lived in my studio apartment for like <laughs> multiple more years because yeah. I was too busy and you know I didn't do this for the money anyway. Like I thought this was an interesting thing to do and build, uh, even though I didn't like the mission of like selling ringtones and mobile contents, uh, and I wanted other mission. 
when when it comes to um, lessons learned with with Zingy, I, I I love to also learn about the scaling, the 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 fast growth, bringing in talent and making sure everyone's on the same page. Uh, are there some, are, are there, is there a particular lesson, any particular pitfalls, anything that you can share uh, for founders out there right now that uh, are going through that, right? They found product market fit. Now they're, they're growing at a pretty fast clip. And what, what, you know, what are things that they should keep an eye on or the questions they should be asking themselves? Um, the good news for us is our core team, you know, the CTO, me, et cetera, were like, in place and we did it was really execution on existing contracts so it didn't really require fundamental new senior hires um i think the only thing i would change differently is like regardless of the talent of someone i i, I which i since implemented is a no asshole policy like you cannot be mm. uh you can i love that regardless of your iq ability to deliver whatever if like if you're not a good person to other people and you don't treat treat, treat people well you have no place here uh, it took me too long to realize that. Um, and But other than that, not really. Um, I made more hiring mistakes in the first company because uh, my VCs were pushing me to hire like, you know, gray haired, experienced people. And I, and and they were just not a cultural fit for the company. Like in, in tech startups, it's better to make the wrong decision, but learn from it and, and pivot than like to try to get consensus to find the perfect answer, which never exists. And so... Um, mm. I, yeah, and, people that and you fit with your culture make may make a lot of sense. You mentioned that uh, you ended up selling for eighty million cash offer. Um, what are are there some lessons there? Uh, I remember hearing you mention about investment that you brought in an investment bank and that that was actually very helpful. Being able to do that, can you can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I, I um so first of all, I I kept getting buyout offers once we became profitable for like eight million, ten million, twelve million, and then I said like I'm not selling. And then this buyer came and offered forty, and I'm like, okay, this is now I realize how much money that is, and it is life changing. I own half the company, and I've been so close to zero so many times. I'm like, let's definitely consider it. I hired a banker to run an auction and they looked at like ten different potential buyers and they increased the price, but frankly just because they run an auction from 40 to 80. So that was a helpful, uh, number one. Number Incredible. two, just as importantly, during the negotiation of the stock purchase agreement, et cetera, they could play the role of backup. Because obviously if the buyer, you want to have a good relationship with the buyer, you're going to be there for a while. They're going to lock you up. And, and I stayed there for 18 months. So you can't be the one negotiating every little detail in, your, in, in the sales contract. And so... The natural division of labor is the bankers, the backups, you're the good cop, meaning that I will tell them like, look, buyer, I want to work with you, but my bankers are telling me what you're offering is not market and, and that I'd be silly to accept that. I just don't want to look silly in front of them, but give me something I can work with that <laughs> seems reasonable. Obviously, I'm the one actually telling them what I want to do. <laughs> right, right. So I'm the one driving uh, totally. that, but like from a optics perspective, you appear to be the compromising nice guy and the bankers are the evil people that are negotiating so aggressively and so with that good cop bad cop routine it is very effective so the the, the bankers i hired were worth every penny uh they play the role of the bad cop they doubled the price we got what we needed and it was amazing i love that uh let, let's move into a, the last of the three big ventures here olx uh for this third venture i heard you originally want to improve Craigslist, but that did not work out. So you created OLX. Uh, you decided to launch it in a hundred countries, invest, investing 50K per country. Uh, where did that idea come from? This go to market uh, of, of exactly what I mentioned, all these countries dedicating a slice for each one and seeing what, what sticks. How did that come about? So I, I loved marketplaces. I studied market design in college. I My first startup, obviously, which is an eBay of Europe, was a, and, and I helped build an eBay of Latin America, were marketplaces. Um, I love the asset light nature, the winner takes most from nature, the fact that you bring liquidity in otherwise opaque markets. This was what I really wanted to build. So had mm -hmm. I not been 
resource constrained, <laughs> I would not have built Zingy. I would have built something like OLX earlier. In fact, I own the OLX domain. I bought it in 98. Uh, so it's something oh. I'd been meaning to buy uh, and, and build for a long time. Um, and in hindsight, I should have built a classified site to begin with, not an auction site, though perhaps people would not have funded it because they didn't believe in the business model. It didn't exist until later. Um, mm. So in 2005, um, as I was, um, I knew I wanted to exit Zingy. It was in the company I was meant to be building, and I didn't like the people I sold it to. They were a Japanese company. We had massive cultural misunderstandings. I had the opportunity to buy Shazam for like a million dollars, and they said no. I mean, there are a lot of things we could have wow. done. And I'm like, look, yeah. if you're not, if you're not, they would take all my profits, send it to Japan. I'm like, look, if you want someone like me, to go build a billionaire company. Let me conquer the world. If not. You don't need me, you know, like right. it's just to maximize profits, you know, <laughs> let me go do my own thing. So after 18 months, I left um, and Craigslist has already started becoming a cultural phenomenon in the U.S. in terms of liquidity. But I felt that they were doing a disservice to the community because they were not moderating the content. They had an old UX UI. So I went to Craig and Jim and I'm like, look, I'll do it for free. Like not because I want to make money out of this, but because I think you're not helping the humanity by by having the spam, the scam, this prostitution, murders, et cetera. Like we could do right. a much better job here, but you have liquidity. So let's take advantage of that. And they said no. So then I try to buy them out. They also said no. Uh, so I'm like, okay, let's go build it. Now to answer your question directly, why try to launch in 100 countries? Um, once someone has network effects in marketplaces, it's very hard to break. And there are already incumbent players in the U.S., like Craigslist or in France, that had network effects, and mm. it, it would take tens of millions in these countries, and that type of capital was still not available. Now, the VCs that had not funded me in my last company all of a sudden were throwing themselves at, uh, over the <laughs> at me <laughs> because I had been very successful in the last company. So now right. I had capital. I had 10 million to go to launch, uh, but I didn't feel that was enough to go and like take Craigslist head on. And I realized there's a certain amount of serendipity in these uh, marketplace side businesses as to what, what takes off when, where, et cetera. Now, I knew how to build supply. When you build a marketplace, you, it's, you typically start at the supply because the sellers are financially motivated to be in the platform. You can go to them and tell them, hey, look, I don't currently have any buyers, but I'm free. So it costs you nothing to be here. Why don't you list? And people typically are willing to list. Mm. Um, and... And so I, I did that, you know, in the core categories of like uh, for sale goods, real estate, cars in a hundred countries. Again, 50K, at the, back in the day, there was much less competition in general. Many countries had no incumbent players. I could buy uh, long tail marketing on Google for like a penny a click, especially in these uh, wow. secondary countries. Right. Uh, and, and all the content like SEO, every single listing is an, is an ad that could be indexed. So we, we launched, um, I'm not sure if I'd seen this done anywhere else, but I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'd seen serendipity happen in marketplaces before. And so we launched and it really took off in four places. And so focus on these four, closed down all the other countries and then use the profits for these four. So it really worked in, it really, really, really worked in Portugal and Pakistan, but obviously these are not large markets. It kind of worked reasonably well in Brazil, um, and India. So we're like, hey, this, this is where we're going to focus. So we yeah, focused on these four. Once we became very successful and profitable in Brazil, then we used the profits from there to then go and expand to the other countries and ultimately ended up with, uh, yeah, 350 million uniques a month in 30 countries with over 10,000 employees. Jeez. Uh, wow. Was it, I love that you went after all these countries. Was it helpful that because of this scale, you had much you had better clarity of of what the numbers indicated, right? Like you could clearly see the difference in oh, in yeah. take from Brazil and all that. Whereas yeah, if mean, you might I, have I done it sense. in fewer countries, you might not have gotten the or or was that not something? I, I, that... Yeah, but you need to remember, I built two, two auction sites before, right? Like Dedamate became my Carlo Libre and and Auckland. I knew that a successful. A marketplace that sells goods as liquidity, if the probability of you selling is about, if you list something, it's about 20, 25%. That's when you start getting liquidity. And mm. and yes, I did have an A-B test across all these 100 countries. Um, 
and some clearly emerge as as dominant. But I, I knew what metrics I was looking for: net new listing per per thousand capita in the country. Uh, so I, I had a very very clear KPIs or OKRs of what I was looking for. And yes, having these different countries that helped compare between them. Um, and then, as I said, I mean, we went from a hundred down to four, and then and then re expanded eventually once we'd won these to uh, to thirty, uh, and where Olexis kind of is today. Having having marketplaces be your your sweet spot, uh, what would you say are some vital customer acquisition lessons when it comes to building a marketplace? You, you mentioned a couple of things, but if we could go a little bit deeper into yeah. that. So I typically start on the supply because the supply is financially motivated to be in the platform, but I you highly curate your supply and you don't the biggest single mistake founders can make in marketplaces is put infinite supply in the platform. And the problem is if you do that is there's no buyers for it, so the sellers are not engaged. They're going to churn, and the, and maybe if, even if there's a buyer, they won't reply because they haven't been engaged before. And so you find very select, high quality sellers. You make sure they're happy and motivated. Then you find demand for them, and once you have liquidity at that level, it could be national, it could be high, it's zip code, it could be whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. Once you have liquidity, then you scale supply a bit more, then you bring demand and you keep scaling in parallel, making sure that you keep liquidity metrics yeah, and liquidity throughout and that both your sellers and buyers are happy. And that's when eventually you start seeing the network effects kick in. Your, your business is really has network effects once you see your CACs go down, right? So as you scale, many companies see your, their cost of acquisitions increase then they're not network effect businesses. They're they're still driven by whatever paid acquisition channel or, or sales team they're using. Um, network effect businesses really with scale, you actually start seeing lower and lower CACs. Um, and in the early days, in fact, your CACs could be very high because they're you're injecting liquidity in the market. And that's okay as long as you you keep a very clear track of whether or not you have liquidity and things are working. That's so interesting that you start with the supply versus the the demand, my initial reaction, and I haven't done uh, a marketplace, yeah. but my initial reaction ha would be make sure that you actually have someone that actually cares to buy this thing um, and versus uh, providing something. But in your case, you're saying like, make sure that the quality is there in the supply and then that should attract the demand. That the demand is harder to get. Let's start there. Um, and people have money options to buy something. And so getting demand is expensive. And 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 it, unless you have something for them, they're not going to come to you. And so getting them for is not that super useful. As I said, the reason I started supply is not because it's because it's actually easy or easier, right? If you're a real estate broker and tell them, hey, list all your you can put your properties here for free, they'll do it. Or if you go to car. I, I use car sales where it's like, hey, list your cars here for free. They'll do right. it. Or, yeah. So I start there because it's actually something that I can get that has a certain amount of value that I can then bring to buyers to convince them to, to, to convert. So I start with the easy side and then I go to the hard side. Uh, was there a particular uh, sector that you focus in a niche first uh, and had had that what what was that sector and and how yes. did you decide to then pick what the next you know what what the next sector would be yes so many of the countries we were in didn't have functioning payment systems and didn't have functioning delivery mechanisms there's no post office and mm. and people so classifieds were more powerful in these types of countries because there's no amazon there's no ebay there's n there's no alternative um and I thought long and hard what category we should focus on. And we started on used goods, especially things like electronics, cell phones, because mm -hmm. the in used goods, people transact multiple times a month, right? The problem, is, so I knew that the very valuable categories were cars and real estate, but cars and real estate, people transact once every five, 10 years. And so it does not lead to recurring organic traffic. But in used goods, if you're buying and selling video games and, and cell phones and computer parts, et cetera, actually you get your users engaged. And so that allowed us to have the cheapest form of traffic. And so ultimately we had organic traffic. Most of our, all, all, the vast majority of our traffic is organic coming on average two times a month to transact. And then you could use that traffic to go and win cars and real estate. And so using the used goods which is a high recurrence category to then fund 
extension and mm. GB high, high value by low recurrence categories made the most sense. And that was a big difference with our competitors um, and allowed us essentially to add compete because our customer acquisition costs were lower. You know, we, we'd acquire someone for very, very cheap to come and whatever, buy a video game for $10 or $5. And then eventually they'd buy a car. <laughs> how, how did you structure, uh, let's say when you moved into Brazil or you moved into India and you said all focus, all energy goes, all resources go this direction. Yeah. Uh, how did you structure the, the team and, 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 and the go to market within, cause they're so different uh, you know, there's, there's so different places, but maybe they're not they're like what they're you not. said, right? They're not. It's... What are the core categories in India and Brazil? They're the same cars, real estate, cell phones, video games, computer parts, uh, furniture. I mean, they're, they're the same categories everywhere. They're the same needs, uh, the same concerns on preventing scams and spam and phishing and prostitution mm. and stuff like that. Um, and the same types of sellers, right? Like we would go to uh, car dealers and real estate brokers or or agencies and uh, to get listings. And so the approach was the same. And in fact, for the longest time, we didn't have anyone on the ground in any of those countries. I, I centralized all operations in Buenos Aires. Um, we mm. we had, because Deremate had been built in Buenos Aires. So when Mercado Libre bought Deremate, I took over the entire team and it was the same thing. And, and so it's just, it, basically I followed the exact same strategy I'd followed my auction site in terms of starting with supply, uh, centralizing the tech platform. And because Buenos Aires is a cosmopolitan city where you have people from all around the world, we had the customer care team for Russia, for Brazil, for India, et cetera, in Buenos Aires. Eventually we opened wow. local operations, but for the longest time we were all centralized in Buenos Aires, uh, same categories and obviously slightly different categories and obviously you needed the geographic makeout of these countries to be different, but pretty funnily, yeah, everything centralized and it worked really, really well. That's incredible. And I, I wanted to just uh, spend a little bit of time uh, and, and delve deeper into the marketplace. So thanks for sharing that. Mostly because as when we fast forward to your role now as founding partner at FJ Labs, when you've invested over 1,100 companies, including major players like Alibaba and Kupang, uh, having over 900 active investments, all that, uh, your you your investment thesis falls with marketplaces, right? Isn't that still very much where you where you place your emphasis on, or is that one of the things? And and there's more. Well, the I'm an accidental VC, first of all. So I never set out to be VC. It just so happens that while I was running all these companies, I was very visible to consumer, to consumers and to the public. And so other founders said, hey, can you invest? And I thought long and hard, should I be an investor while I'm a CEO? Is it a distraction from my core mandate? But I'm like, look, if I can articulate lessons learned to others, makes me a better founder. If I can keep my fingers on the pulse of the market, makes me a better founder. So as mm. long as I find up, I find a way to invest very quickly, it doesn't take more than one hour to decide if I invest or not, it's okay. So by 2013, when I sold OLX, I made 175 investments out of like dozens of exits, was doing really well. So I'm like, you know what? With my partner, Jose, who had co-founded Deremate with me, I'm like, let's create a family office, keep investing. And then people started saying, hey, we would like... Uh, to invest with you. And so we created uh, a first VC fund in 2016. But frankly, what we do is angel investing at venture scale. We behave like angels, right? I still invest in uh, two one-hour meetings. We decide if we invest or not, et cetera. Now, the reason it's marketplaces, is, of course, I've been focusing and building and investing marketplaces for the last 25 years. And I actually even studied market design in college. Um, right. And I, I still like network effect businesses Red large. And so my definition of marketplace is rather broad. It's an intermediary between a buyer or something and a seller or something. You know, so a fintech company that's lending capital is usually a marketplace because there's a provider capital and buyer capital, for instance. So mm. it's a broad definition. And these days we're mostly doing B2B marketplaces. Uh, it is our bread and butter. Uh, the reason it's not the sole focus is we do have a philosophy that if you've done right by us, um, we will invest, we'll back you no matter what you do the second time around. And at this point, we've backed 2,000 founders, 300 wow. exits, 150 wow. of them we made money on, 150 money of them we lost money on, and the 150 we made money on, that's about 300 founders. So if these 300 founders are coming back and they're like, hey, I'm building a new company, regardless of what they're doing, they get a check from us. 
That's and, an incredible amount of exits. Uh, oh yeah, that that ratio is insane. Um, yeah, and also wow. a credible amount of success, right? Making money in half the deals we invested in. Uh, so we 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 treat follow-ons as though we were not existing investors. So we don't always follow on and it, and we often sell on the way up. So we sell our winners. It's like the anti-VC strategy. When we feel something is overvalued, we'll sell half our position. And so in 2021, when everyone else was going crazy, I wrote a blog post entitled Welcome to the Everything Bubble, where I, I articulated why I thought that every asset class from real estate uh, bonds to public equities to crypto to SPACs to NFTs to Late privates, especially late stage privates, were valued and why people should be selling as much as they could. Now, of course, it's a private market, so you, we only sold a fraction of what we wanted to, but nonetheless, we had a fair amount of exits because there was a moment where other VCs would buy you in secondaries. Uh, and we typically would sell 50% of our position in, in many of the companies in the up brands. Um, and by the way, the, the founders would be happy for it. They'd ask us to sell because they didn't want to get too diluted by the new primary equity coming in the company. And by these 300 founders, let me give you an example. We we backed a founder called Brett Adcock, uh, who built a company called Vettery. It was a labor marketplace. We sold it at mm-hmm. Deco for 100 million. We made like 8.5 extra money and pretty quickly. And then he decided he was going to build an electric flying taxi company, self-flying taxi company called Archer. So we get, we didn't even take a call. We're like, here's our check. We didn't we right. didn't even negotiate. Uh, and then he sold that or took it public or whatever. And then he decided to build a humanoid wow. robot electric company, electric robots that are humanoid to replace humans and 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 picking packing warehouses. We also sent out a check, also didn't really take a call. You know, and so <laughs> as yeah. there are now 300 of these founders running around, uh, that is becoming an increasingly large portion of the portfolio. Uh, that that said, we still do marketplaces because network effect businesses are beautiful, right? As I said, customer acquisition costs decrease as they scale, their winner yeah. takes most, they're capital efficient. Yeah, a, a, once you have liquidity, it doesn't take that much capital to win. What what criteria do you prioritize when you're selecting startups to invest in? Uh, it, yeah, so we have four criteria and they're very explicit and, and we require all four to invest. So some VCs will tell you, I only invest in extraordinary founders and that's it, that's the only criteria. That's not true for us. Uh, we want extraordinary founders, which which for us as a definition, uh, but I'll, I'll explain that. So I want an amazing team, a good business, meaning good time and unit economics, fair deal terms, nothing's cheap in tech, but fair, and that matches our thesis of where the world is heading and that is making the world a better place, addressing either inequality of opportunity or climate change or the mental and and, and well-being uh, and physical well-being crisis. And, and so let me... Double click on all four. Number one, team. We want people that are extraordinarily eloquent because people that are very eloquent are in a better position to raise capital, to attract better teams, to do better BD, better PR, et cetera, and know how to execute. And the way I tease out in a one-hour call if they know how to execute is the way they describe number two, which is how attractive the business is. And I mm-hmm. care deeply about unit economics. Now, we're mostly seed and A. That's our bread and butter. But we will do some pre-seed. And even pre-seed, I want the founder to be able to articulate what he thinks estimated customer acquisition costs looks like based on landing page analysis, density of keyword analysis, uh, conversion rate from the landing page signups to what he thinks purchases will be based on what the industry averages are. And he better be able to articulate what the margin structure of the business is. Like, this is the AOV, and I expect him to give me an AOV that's in line with the industry. And this is their margin structure. And, even, and the unit economics I look for is one where you recoup your fully loaded CAC on a contribution margin two basis after six months and you three X that after 18 months. And who knows what your LTV to CAC is because A, you haven't been live for more than 18 months. And B, you know, <laughs> ideally you have negative churn. And so ultimately it's 10 to one, 20 to one, whatever. Uh, and if you're not there, I want to know why you're going to get there with scale without needing every star in the multiverse together. Number three, I want the deal terms to be fair. We invest in 200 companies a year. So we know what the median valuation is. And we want to invest in something that's fair. And so right now, you know, it's like a seed round. You're raising your, if you're a marketplace where you're doing 150K in GMV or maybe 30K in net revenues, and you're raising three at 10 pre seed. Pre seed, you're maybe raising one at five pre. And an A round, you're doing five, 600K in GMV or maybe 100, 150K in net revenues or MRR, and you're raising seven at 23 pre. 
Uh, and the mean, I, uh, the mean is higher. And of course, if you're a second time founder, the valuation might be higher. But on that, mm -hmm. that's where re really the market is today. And the Bs right now, you're doing two and a half million in GMV a month with a 15% take rate or maybe five, six, 700K in MRR, and you're raising 15 at 50 pre. If you're way off of that, we may pass through some price and it's okay. Well, maybe we'll revisit the next round if you grow into the valuation. And number four, we have, as I said, very clear theses on the future of work, the future of food, the future of real estate, the future of automotive, the future of mobility. We want things that fall in line with that future. And we need all four criteria to be collectively true. Um, and even an amazing team, if we don't like the rest, we're not doing it. I love that. Well, that's Thank you for, for that breakdown. Super clear. Uh, when it comes to, I, I remember you hearing, and this will be... Uh, there's two more questions. This is one of them. And and, and I'm very appreciative of your time. Um, you'd mentioned about, we were talking about the future and, and where your investments are now, what investments get you super excited. I heard you talk about uh, like B2B services and, and, and improving uh, and, and within a number of industries uh, how how things get done really? Um, it, can you can you go into bit a little bit into that? Uh, you you're discussing uh, what was it like in the manufacturing sector? Uh, yeah, I, so I, I'd say B two B marketplaces are bread and butter right now. There's five sub segments, but let me take a step back. So if you look at your consumer life, you have an amazing experience. Amazon, you can order anything and get it in a day or two, or DoorDash for food, or Uber for cars, or Airbnb, or Booking.com, and 25% of your online of your purchases has basically been digitized as a consumer. But if you're a business, you're still in the dark ages with like sub 1% penetration in most categories. So imagine you want to buy petrochemicals. There's no online catalog. There's no connectivity to the factory to see availability. Uh, and there's no pricing, there's no online ordering, there's no online payments, there's no tracking of your order, there's no insurance, and there's no financing. And all these could be different companies. And this needs to happen in every major vertical. So number one, digitizing B2B supply chains of inputs. So <clears throat> petrochemicals, that's Nodi, or uh, uh, steel, it's like Metal Loop or Rebus, or uh, uh, gravel and like, a company called Shootflex. I mean, every major input category. Number mm -hmm. two, digitizing SMBs. Anyone who started a small business did it because they loved the category. You know, you're, you started a pizzeria because you like cooking pizzas and chit-chatting with your customers. You did not start a pizzeria because you're like, I am excited to be building a website, entering comments with Google and Yelp, uh, negotiating with <laughs> most suppliers, doing a deal with Uber and DoorDash, uh, getting a POS, doing accounting. No. And so we're investing in companies that do all the grunt work. So it kind of falls in future of work and SMB enablement for them. So we're investors in, uh, in, in Slice for pizzerias and Scents for dry cleaners and Odeco for coffee shops and Cheaper in Colombia for bodegas and uh, mm. Fresha for, for barber shops. Um, you know, and, and some of these have real scale. I mean, Fresha is, I think, 70,000 barbershops, billions in, in payment volume going through the platform. It really transforms the lives of these SMB owners. Number three, moving supply chains out of, it, out of China into friendly countries, uh, especially India. So mm. friend shoring, I guess, would be the core thesis, and there's massive tailwinds, but... If you're, and this kind of falls in the second category as well. If you're a little manufacturer in India, you own a factory. All you want to do is manufacture. What you don't want to be doing is answering RFQs, doing prototyping, dealing with like exports and customs and invoicing and getting paid by these big companies in Europe or in the US. And so we're investors in marketplaces for apparel, for ceramics, for rugs, for linen, et cetera that are helping these SMB manufacturers in India scale and sell to the West. But for the buyers, it's it's fundamental because they're also moving their supply chains out of China, which is a massive geopolitical risk regardless. Mm -hmm. Number four, labor marketplaces that support all these things. So we're investors in WorkRise, which is a, uh, a, a, a labor marketplace for oil services workers or, or uh, people doing solar installations, et cetera. And we're investors in Trusted Health, which is... Uh, nurses, 
um, hundreds of millions of GMV were investors in Job and Talent, which is a blue collar worker marketplace in 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 Spain and in Southern Europe. And I guess number five, the infrastructure layer that supports all these B2B marketplaces. So we're investors in Flexport, which is a digital freight forwarder, in ShipBob, yeah, which is a last mile picking, packing, delivery platform, and many, many, many others like payment companies like Rapid or Stripe uh, mm. that, that are supporting these uh, these different types of, of companies. And so that's really the bread and butter today. But we end up doing a lot of fun, interesting things uh, because of like the intramural network we have, but also where curiosity takes us. Fabrice, do you have any, um, I, I know that you, you mentioned that uh, twice, uh, twice a year or so that you, 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 you meet up with a number of individuals and you talk about the future and different industries that excite you. Are there, uh, is there, uh, any content from that, that you do share, whether it's through your personal blog or like a white paper on something, anything that, that, uh, you love that you do have and you love for, for people to go to and, and check out. So yes, yeah, so twice a year we do these conferences where I bring LPs, uh, other VC uh, partners, and, and founders to talk about like the future of humanity, what doesn't exist, should exist, how to make the world a better place. Uh, nothing explicit comes out of it except that we some we come up with ideas and then we go look for founders to either build them or we invest in them. <laughs> okay. So it becomes part of like things we build in or invest in the year, year or two Got to it. come. Uh, but yes, I do write a lot of my blog. Um, about trends, theses, uh, where we're at, where we're going. Uh, and I write about everything and anything like um, macroeconomics, uh, crypto, uh, whatever crosses my mind. But it, it usually has, or there is a pretty big overlay of you know, where we are in the in AI, what, what is the state of entrepreneurship. Uh, and, and so it is a way for me to structure my thoughts and, and create a conversation with the community at large. We'll we'll make sure to uh when when we share our talk to to have your personal blog link there as well. Anything that we didn't cover that you'd love to share? Anything else that uh, uh you love to share with the community? Or uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's I'm, up to you. I guess my the one analysis is I'm profoundly optimistic about where we are, and we're still at the very beginning of the tech revolution. We are about to digitize the entire B two B world, and that's a trend that's going to take 10, 20 years. It's massively deflationary. Because it's deflationary, it's inclusionary, and will increase people's uh, purchasing power and quality of life. We're on the verge of a massive revolution in, in climate tech, where we're seeing now the deflationary power of tech through batteries and solar becoming so much cheaper than everything else that we're going to completely transition our, our energy creation to 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 carbon free uh, to a carbon free system to the point that I suspect that the marginal cost of electricity within 30 20 40 years will be zero which will actually lead mm -hmm. another revolution we're going to be able to like you know grow crops in the desert desalinate uh, salt water i mean it, there is so much positive things that are coming uh that if you take a step back that the, the trends are so optimistic and and ai itself will probably lead to a massive productivity revolution which will transform our lives for the better now we are at the top of the hype cycle so probably in the next few years is going to disappoint and it's going to take a while before it's incorporated in government and in large enterprise where it will really impact productivity but in 10 years 20 years it'll probably completely transform the life we live for the better and so I, I'm super excited as well. Yeah, I am so excited. We're we're on the verge of building a better world of tomorrow, which will be a word of world of equality of opportunity of plenty, and it'll be inter environmentally sustainable. So I'm excited to be part of helping to build this world, and uh, you should be too. Yes. Well, thank you so much for the time. Thank, thank you, you, Fabrice. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Take care. Take care.